on the growth illusion. Have central banks broken the link between financial markets and the real economy? You know something fundamental has changed when the tax man asks people to hold off paying what they owe. But that's exactly what happened in the canton of Zug, just outside Zurich recently. Why? Because the authorities are worried they might end up paying negative interest rates on the cash that they get in early. It's the topsy-turvy world of extreme monetary policy, where quantitative easing and negative interest rates from central banks have broken taboos, pushed up asset prices, devalued currencies, but so far failed to drive the strong, consistent economic growth that they were looking for. Good afternoon. My name is Thorold Barker from the Wall Street Journal, and I'm delighted to welcome our esteemed panel to discuss how successful these central bank policies have been so far, and in the light of sharp sell-offs around the world in markets today and in recent days, what is likely to happen next. First of all, Raghuram Rajan is governor of the Reserve Bank of India. Previously, as chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, from 2003 to 2007, Mr. Rajan became known for his prescient warnings about the dangers posed by complicated credit instruments and warped incentives during the US housing boom. Axel Weber is chairman of Swiss banking giant UBS. Previously, as pre president of Germany's Bundesbank, he famously resigned in 2011, despite being favored to succeed as head of the European Central Bank, in part because of his questions around quantitative easing. Mary Erdos is one of the most powerful women on Wall Street, where she has worked for 25 years in various roles. She was appointed chief executive of JP Morgan Asset Management in 2009 and oversees more than $2.5 trillion of assets around the world on behalf of her clients. And last but not least, Anthony Scaramucci <coughs> joined Wall Street along with Mary in 1989 and has worked at Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers. She's, she's a lot younger than me. I just want to point that out, but go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, he founded Skybridge, an alternative asset manager, in 2005 and has $13 billion under management. He also runs the um, very popular SALT hedge fund conference, which, strangely enough, happens in Las Vegas. So welcome to our fantastic panel. Just to kick off, Governor Rajan, central banks stabilized the financial system and the world economy after the crisis with their massive response. Um, with this new, renewed turmoil in, in markets around the world, are we beginning to see the darker side of that intervention? Perhaps. Um, I think that, first, let's remember they did a wonderful job post-crisis. Uh, we would be staring at the Great Depression, or we would be in the midst of it if they hadn't done what they did. And uh, I think people like Axel, uh, Ben Bernanke, they pulled out all stops, they got us back on track. The uh, real problem is that there has been no other game in town since then. And uh, with many central banks with their foot firmly pressed on the accelerator and with a variety of new um, aggressive monetary policies, uh, it's not clear that uh, we've really benefited tremendously. And to some extent, we may have uh, reduce the room for other policies or, or reduce the incentive for others to take policies. The net effect of all this is uh, we have a variety of asset prices where we really don't know whether they're at fundamental levels or not. Uh, certainly bond prices where we've intervened a lot. But once you change long-term interest rates, you also affect equity pricing. Uh, eventually, you affect exchange rates also. So we're in a world where we're not quite sure what the fundamental value of any asset is. And I would suspect that this is part of what is going on today, that as there is some anticipation that central banks will start reducing the accommodation, asset prices are trying to find an appropriate level. And uh, given all that's happened so far, I think some volatility was to be expected. And actually, I mean, you obviously had some concerns about quantitative easing um, <clears throat> when all this was happening uh, the first time round. What is your sense of that? Has that disconnect, that fact that we're not quite sure where assets should be, how does that affect people's ability to, you know, to trust markets, to deploy capital effectively, and to what extent is it holding back proper capitalist recovery? My concern at the time was much less about expanding the balance sheet of the central bank or moving rates to zero, which is what we did and I was all in favor of doing that. My concern was more 
about the specific tools to be used in a bank-based system like Europe. I felt long-term repos where you would try and finance through the banks, who basically are the credit providers in Europe, and they are the ones that fund most of the investment, was a better and more sustainable avenue, and you were the lender of last resort to the banks than being the buyer of first resort, in particular in a targeted fashion of assets that the market did not want to pick up at current prices. And so my concern was more about the early purchases and doing that without attaching any program conditionality. It was just basically solving a problem of supply uh, to the market where the market didn't want to pick it up at price. So that was my concern. I've always been hesitant to subscribe to long targeted augmentations of central bank's balance sheet uh, to where you basically change the risk reward calculus in financial markets. The whole QE is aimed at basically distorting prices and incentivating investors to go into riskier assets. And at a point in time when you do that, I think it might be warranted, but the longer you keep that medication up, the more distortions you produce in more and more markets. Remember at the start, for until 2000 and I would say 12, exchange rates stayed pretty stable throughout that process because the world in itself was applying similar policies. Then central banks started very targeted and massive augmentations of central bank balance sheets, you know, sometimes dubbed as competitive easing, which has started to affect exchange rates. And whilst interest rate policies have also redistributive effects, they're largely there domestically. Where if you focus on competitive easing, you have international effects and you, you basically impact on trade, on international investments, and therefore you better have a consensus around doing that and that consensus wasn't there. And is that what we're seeing at the moment with some of these big flows? We saw, I think today, that in emerging markets last year, there was 700 and I think it was 35 billion that flowed out of emerging markets last year. Is that what we're seeing here? Is competitive devaluation shifting assets around the world in destabilizing ways? Look, investment was easy in the world of QE because the countries that massively expanded their balance sheet were the ones that basically caused fixed income to not yield any reasonable return and therefore people moved and rotated into equity. When countries did that for a long period of time, uh, then basically the market more and more fostered a, a strong equity market. The US had a three years bull market in equities. Now, when the Fed hinted at tightening policy and uh, first of all stopped, uh, you know, slowed down the purchases, so the tapering, and then started talking about raising rates for the first time, other countries like Europe and Japan were massively adding more stimulus. And that's where policy started to diverge. Right. And I think the issue is the current policy divergence, which I think is driving some of this international volatility. My view is this cannot last for long because we've never seen a decoupling. The only way this could last was for the US to completely uncouple from the rest of the world. We're more coupled than we ever were, both for good markets. The US moved from 8% to almost 15% openness. They're much more linked to the rest of the world through the dollar. So if the US were to stay coarse, the dollar would continue to rise. And I think that would recouple the economies. And so at some point, you're going to see the impact of current policies uh, are starting to mitigate. In, in the end, the question is what we'll give. The market seems to not put a lot of credibility in the Fed's announcement that they'll continue to raise rates and seems to think that the Fed eventually will abandon that course. Mary, what do you think? As somebody who, who <clears throat> oversees this large amount of money on behalf of clients, how do you see that playing out? Will the Fed be able to continue to decouple? Well, there's, you know, it, what Axel said, just really, imp there's a really important point embedded in there, which is all the central banks in the world broadcast that they wanted to raise asset prices in order to have wealth effect so that people would spend more money. And that worked. And it worked very successfully and they did their job, mission accomplished. Somewhere in about 2012, when things started to change, there was a law of diminishing returns on the psychological effect of that happening. And so the transfer mechanism of asset prices going up and you wanting to save less and spend more stopped. Why? We had the 10-year US Treasury hit 150. And the world said, what is that telling me? What is that telling me more that I don't understand? The markets generally know more uh, than what's actually happening. And so there you lost that connection. And yet asset prices were already forecasting and continued spending. 
So now you're, you're in a position where you're unwinding some of that or giving time for spending uh, and, and asset values to catch up. So you've had a lot of money go into a lot of the same places, a lot of crowded trades, the IMF tracks where like-to-like -like transactions are going. And you've seen people who were in cash went to bonds. People who were in bonds went to high yield. People who were in high yield added a little more emerging markets. People who were in developed markets equities wanted emerging markets equities. People who wanted public equity started adding pre-IPO mm -hmm. positions into their portfolio. It happened everywhere in almost every asset class. And that's okay if you're aware of what's happening and you understand the process by which that may for, find pieces of uh, times of illiquidity. And that's what you're finding. And so you've got everyone in those crowded trades and if they want to all come out at the same time, that's what we've got. Add to that a lack of liquidity that used to be provided by the investment banks. And you've got a mixture of things that are just trying to find, find their prices. And that's been the first you know, two and a half weeks of this year. But that sounds like a recipe for a, a slightly bigger correction than we've seen so far, if there's that much, um, that many areas where people really have pushed the boundaries. Well, all of those areas have pushed the boundaries, but don't forget how much excess cash there is in the world. There is an, there is cash in almost every pocket of the world that is waiting for the confidence to be able to go back into the marketplace. So you ask about the Fed, you know, there's a lot to what the Fed is doing and it's trying to telecast that it is not trying to tighten, it is trying to normalize. And it just needs to get back to a position of normalization. And to the extent it can normalize, it can send a signal of confidence to the world. Because if you look at the US consumer, J.P. Morgan Chase banks about half the households in the United States of America. And you look at their debt levels, they're still about 18% below where they were at their highs in 2007. You look at their debt servicing levels, they're at all time lows, back 35 years at only 10% of their uh, disposable income. You look at consumer confidence at the 93.5 level that it just came in and is much higher than the 85 average that you've seen. You look at mortgage uh, mortgages and you look at new home spending and that hasn't even gotten back to the levels that it is. And you look at overall household wealth. Household wealth in the United States of America is 59% higher than it was post the crisis and 29% higher than it was pre the crisis. So there's a lot there that can be put to work when there's confidence back in the system. So Anthony, on that, I mean, do you think that um, the economy can grow into asset prices or do you think asset prices can, can you have to adjust down to well, meet the economy. I just want to touch more on what Mary's saying. See, I actually think the Fed gets an A-plus on asset restoration, asset reflation, but they have an incomplete on the consumer side of the economy because most of the middle class and the lower middle class do not hold assets. And so those assets did not go up in value. And, and, and Mary would probably second me on this. At the low, 27 million American homes were underwater, meaning that their mortgages were above where the price of the uh, the asset was actually trading. So they couldn't refinance. They couldn't experience the effect of those lower interest rates and put more cash flow in their pocket. And so that's one of the main reasons why the United States is not growing as fast as it could be. Now that number, 27 million, is down to about 14 million. And so, so I, I think we're gonna be okay because of what Mary is saying, that there is pent up consumption about to get unleashed on America and perhaps the rest of the world. There's also pent up capital investments. Uh, you mentioned 2.4 trillion that J.P. Morgan is uh, running in terms of its assets, but there's about 2.4 trillion dollars of cash on the balance sheet of the S&P 500. If we get the right policies, and this is a big problem for the world, uh, we've been overly reliant on monetary policy, but we've had no tax reform in the United States, no real meaningful regulatory reform, no massive incentive from the government and our policymakers to unleash the capital investments that we need to create the multiplier effect. But that's gonna happen. I just believe that over the next 12 to 36 months. And so we'll get out of whatever this downturn is right now. So I'm sort of fascinated that everybody sort of acknowledges that assets are mispriced, or at least there's a lot of dislocation, but no one seems particularly concerned about that. I mean- well, I think what Mary said, and I wanna to add to that one aspect is, we were concerned last year that there is such a consensus trade in the market that everyone was going into the same asset classes at the same time. Unwinding a consensus trade has much bigger pricing impact than unwinding diverse investment strategies. What is reassuring for me, and I think that's why I have a much more positive outlook than, than some of the sentiment around the meetings here, is there is no new consensus trade. People actually differ on whether the Fed will continue 
to see through what they said they would do or whether they would go away from that. People actually do not believe that central banks or fiscal authorities have a lot of room to maneuver left. So it will be up to other policies, structural policies, and fixing our economies that after these eight years of holding out, uh, we'll have to pick in. And that will basically be mastered by different countries with a different degree of success. The world is normalizing. And we used to be in an upside down world where growth was led by emerging markets that had great inflows of capital. And some of them used that capital. Well, India is one example. Others, like Brazil, found it hard to make good use of these capital inflows. And now that we're seeing the capital flows reversals, because the US is normalizing as well, we're seeing the US back at the lead table in the front. Growth is driven out of industrial countries. The fourth industrial revolution will largely benefit developed countries because it's tech driven. It's driven by connectivity. It requires big infrastructures to exist, to be utilized. And emerging markets will benefit less from that. Again, that used to be the case with the first, second, and third industrial revolution. It's the case also with the fourth. Can I, I mean, just turning to emerging markets, that's, that's a fairly positive view on Europe and the US. Um, <clears throat> what we've seen in some developing markets has been you know, pretty tough. Brazil has had a very, very tough time. China is clearly slowing down. Other emerging markets have seen a lot of outflows, big currency depreciations, big asset corrections. But what's your sense running the central bank of one of the, the big emerging markets of how much pain will be felt in those emerging markets and how much will spread back into the developing world? Well, certainly there's been a lot of uh, uh, flows into the emerging markets. And as Axel said, we've used them to different extents properly. And some of it is flowing out. I, I think we need to focus on, uh, on, on the fundamentals. Really, we're in a world of make-believe. And uh, your question of whether asset prices move to fundamentals or fundamentals move to asset prices, well, what really are the fundamentals? What's, what's interesting in the world that, that is likely to pick up over time? And clearly, the tech revolution is, is important. Uh, where is it showing up? Not yet. Uh, we don't see it in the productivity, productivity numbers. Why is it not showing up? A variety of reasons. Perhaps it takes time uh, for it to show up in business practice, and we're on the verge uh, that's the new age that we're looking forward to. Perhaps we haven't monetized it yet. Uh, we, we don't see movies anymore in the theater. We see it on our computer, but we don't pay as much for seeing it on the computer. So it's a question of monetizing it. And perhaps we're not measuring it. Uh, it's really high quality stuff that we get today in terms of service, but uh, it's, it's counted at the, as the same old right. service. Today we, we can pick a hotel in a, in a remote place because of the reviews that we see on it, we couldn't do it in the past, but we don't adjust for the fact that now the hotel we can pick is a better hotel and, and, and quality adjusted, we have a better life. So there are all these things happening. I would disagree a little bit with Axel on whether this applies to emerging markets also. The tremendous change is happening in emerging markets. Take India itself. Um, in third tier towns, small towns, today you can buy from the net and you can get delivery uh, through new logistic systems that are, uh, that are emerging. Mm -hmm. These are massive online marketplaces, which allow some housewife in a, or, or, uh, or a stay-at-home husband in a, in a small village uh, or a town to be able to buy anything. And with the price of real estate in India, this is a massive development because you don't have to have the physical location. Warehouses are fine mm -hmm. and you can get pretty much everything that way. But it also helps the merchant. The small uh, carpet maker in Srinagar can now set up a website and across the world he can sell his carpets. He eliminates the middleman who used to take a lot and prevent the kind of investment that used to take place. So lots of changes happening, I think a lot for the good and technology will really be the emerging market solution to some of the old problems they had, including logistics, including corruption. So you think this is more of a markets problem than a real economy problem? I think markets? it's a markets problem. Of course, markets problems can infect the real economy if they persist for a long time. But I think we have to continue focusing on how we get the real economy up and matching the expectations from the asset price increases. So, so Mary, can you just talk, talk to this quickly? So China has been dominating markets recently. You know, when China <coughs> sells off or has a low growth number or whatever, markets across the world have now reacted quite significantly to those situations. Just quickly, what is your take on the Chinese situation? We sadly lost our China expert who wasn't able to make it here today, but well, um, just, sure. you know, what is, the, what is our collective view on, on China and what impact that's gonna have? 
the, the, the focus and, and for those of us who have been here uh, at the WEF for the last 24 hours, the comments are all about China and oil and what's going to happen and will that affect the world. And the answer is that those two things alone are not going to cause some kind of global you know, disruption, recession, unless something that, that is really a, a left tail event happens. And I don't think that anyone foresees that, and I don't think that the policymakers in China are, are going to let that happen. They're working very hard to do that. Uh, there's a lot of them here who are explaining a lot of the moves and the things that are happening. They, you know, sort of the ball got fumbled as we came out of the gates in the, at the beginning of the year, but there's, um, but there's so much there. And you talk to the people uh, from the region who are here and their excitement about what's happening in the world, their excitement about the capital markets developments within their country, um, and their excitement about you know, population growth there. We can't forget the dynamics that are going to happen that are going to be different than the last 30 years of the one-child policy. All of those lead to different dynamics. Uh, there was a rumor out there this morning that oil was going to trade at a negative level, I guess, like interest rates. I mean, it's just, there, there's a lot of exaggerated points out there, and you have to bring it back to reality, which is you've got a lot of good fundamentals, you've got a lot of cash on the sideline, and you have a lot of people who want to invest. Talk about emerging markets. If you look at the major sovereign wealth funds, central banks and, and really wealthy people in the world, they're continuing to invest, to invest in India. They're continuing to invest in China. They want to look at uh, Japan. That's very interesting to them. They're taking a much more focused look at Mexico. And things like the United States and Europe, when you have wholesale selling, you've got very, very good indiscriminately sold companies that are now at values that they shouldn't be because they had to be sold for liquidity purposes. So purposeful stock selecting and a lot of long short investing, a lot of what Anthony does, a lot of what our hedge fund investors do, that's where people are saying now is the time where they're going to be able to make uh, much greater, greater returns for the clients because you, you get these stretched out valuations and, and, and resets. Anthony, some of your colleagues on, on Wall Street and hedge funds have been charting the, um, the rise of ghost cities in China for, for many years now. <clears throat> to, to what extent do you think that this, uh, where we started, which is that assets aren't necessarily reflecting fundamentals, I mean, has that created significant malinvestment around the world? And do you think that's going to cause a big problem. China is probably the one that people focus on most. Well, I mean, look, look, there's a cabal in the community that's negative on China, and they cite the ghost cities and things like that. But I think the mainstream view that Mary is sharing is going to be the correct view, that China, uh, like every other economy, will go through some level of cyclicality, and their policymakers will do prudent things to make that economy have a softer landing or perhaps slower than the growth that they were traditionally getting over the last 10 or 15 years. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic on China in general. I don't see China falling off the cliff in those super negative scenarios that you hear in the hedge fund community. But there's something interesting going on in the world right now, and you're watching it over the last two weeks. As the Federal Reserve starts to normalize its interest rate policy, uh, you're going to see price discovery enter the markets. And markets are going to start to mean revert back to where their natural price earnings ratios are, where natural return on assets are, what is expected in terms of return on uh, your invested capital in China and places like India. Uh, what Mary discussed earlier, I think, is true. There was an artificiality to what was going on as people pushed themselves further and further out on the risk curve. And so, you know, for us at, at Skybridge, we wrote consistently, stay away from long short managers, stay away from macro managers during this period of quantitative easing because it's impossible for these guys to do their jobs appropriately. And now we're entering an age of more normalization where my prediction is long short managers and macro managers will do way better over the next 10 years than they did in the prior 10 years. Uh, but to think that the world is falling off a cliff uh, when you see the cash levels that are out there, where you see the reserves that China has, and where you see the tools that we have on the fiscal side, not one of us on the panel has mentioned the fiscal side. There was a gigantic opportunity for the American government to borrow a 50-year bond, $10 trillion. It would have cost them $100 billion a year, and they could have rebuilt the entire infrastructure of the United States. Now, they couldn't do that because that deficit, so to speak, ends up on our balance sheet. It confuses people. It makes them think that we're spending recklessly. But we had the opportunity to do that. There will be another opportunity over the next two or three years to reform taxes, get better, more proficient regulatory reform. Maybe we can start uh, doing capital expenditures uh, and deducting it in the first year, which will accelerate 
the opportunity for growth. And so that's all in front of us if uh, policymakers and corporate CEOs So we'll, we'll get to that in one second. But just, just on China quickly, is there a, I mean, people are very nervous about the, the financial market spillovers, less demand from China if you're an exporter, this sort of thing. I mean, is there a bull case out of China that, you know, we have seen this dramatic sell-off in commodities, oil specifically, I think it's down about 70% since 2014. People are, so, uh, currently that's a bit of a negative. It's, it's causing problems in the high yield market in the US, in equity prices. <clears throat> Why haven't we seen a bigger positive impact for particularly Europe, where the cost of energy has plummeted? It's not just Europe, it's China as well. China right. is a major, major beneficiary of that as well. So I think what you're seeing at the moment is, in addition to the spillovers we had to the emerging markets, we're seeing the spillbacks now to the industrial world. And we're very positive on China. Medium to long term, I think the adjustment that is happening at the moment, it is a hard adjustment, but ultimately it'll move things in the right direction. China was living off basically adding low-skill labor to the global production, and basically, as you have the fourth industrial revolution, the return on low-skill labor, artificial intelligence, extreme automation, this will become less. So in that sense, Raghu, I think there is a risk for emerging markets whose global proposition is low-skill labor. It actually is already affecting the mid-skill labor. High-skill labor will benefit hugely from that, and countries like India, who have good education system, who have a quality and quantity of demographics, will benefit because you have skilled labor in abundance to uh, people. And China is on the same track. People look at the industrial production numbers and say China is doing bad. Look at services. Services in China grew at 8.5% in the, in the third quarter. China is moving from being an industrial-based economy that produces mass consumer products for the rest of the world to basically increasing service sectors and the domestic market. That is a much more sustainable and balanced business model, and I think it will be one that is actually uh, for the benefit. Second, China had an investment rate that was close to 50% of GDP. No country can profitably invest mm. domestically such huge amounts for a foreseeable future. So the rebalancing and the opening up and allowing Chinese citizens to invest abroad will be a big part where they add income. Plus, they're a huge consumer of energy and of commodities, so the current correction is actually benefiting mass income there. And that's why I think the seeds for a recovery, in addition to the need for a better and a more direct policy response, and they've got ample room to le uh, left over to respond, will, in my view, improve things as we go through this year. So I'm not at all concerned, and actually I just don't, you know, we just don't say it. We just announced that we will double the jobs that we have in mainland China over the next five years, because we think China is a business case, and being in the business we're in, it's absolutely necessary to be in markets like China. Just a slightly different question on China. Um, there seems to be a general sense that there'll be a, more of a policy response in China to sort out some of the things going on right now. As Axel said earlier, is it possible that you're going to see Japan remaining very aggressive, China becoming more aggressive, Europe <clears throat> probably more aggressive, and the, the US is the only country out there that is really starting to normalize, raise interest rates, the impact that has on the dollar continuing to strengthen. I mean, is that conceivable that that will continue or will the Fed have to put the brakes on, do you think? Um, first, I, I, th I think the Chinese have said again and again that their intent is not to create a massive depreciation in the renminbi. And I think we should take those statements uh, 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 at, uh, at their value because uh, clearly they worry about their place in the world and the spillover effects to other countries, which could be pretty significant if in fact China embarks on this path because they have sufficient capacity uh, to actually go some way on this. Um, we have been in the world in a process of adjusting models. The pre-financial crisis model, which involved a lot of debt fuel growth, didn't work, came to an end. I think China for some time continued along its path while shifting models, but trying to keep the old way of gro growth going and in that process has built up a substantial amount of debt. So one of the big concerns about China, of course, sure. which the Chinese authorities have, is how they deal with that debt. But I think the good news across the world is that we realize that monetary policy is not going to fix the problems, that the change in the models have to happen. Across Europe, you're seeing structural reforms. Uh, you're seeing China move towards this consumption-led uh, path. Certainly in my country, 
we are moving towards a more uh, a, a structure where the government is not so much about directing, but about enabling, about creating the underlying frameworks for growth. And that, I think, will sustain us long term uh, and create growth over 10, 15, 20 years rather than over the next few quarters. So my sense is countries are realizing that stimulus doesn't cut it as much anymore. Certainly monetary stimulus has largely run its course and we have to move to creating the sustainable basis for long run. So on that basis that the central banks are beginning to, to realize that those structural reforms, those investments by governments are a key part to getting back to productivity-led growth, do you think, and just quickly from all of you, I just want just a clear answer, do you think the Fed will be willing to look through market turmoil this time around and continue? I think they're, they're expecting four interest rate rises this year on their own models. And do you think they can actually push that through? Quick answer. See, I, I can't comment on the Fed. I'll leave that okay, to you. Okay, fair enough. Axel, to talk. Axel. I expect U.S. growth to continue to strengthen, and as that happens, the Fed will continue its monetary policy. The Fed will not raise rates if growth slumps, but that's not my outlook. But if markets continue to have volatility and growth is okay, they will continue Markets to are raise. markets. They're, they're nervous. So uh, they will see yeah. through that, in your view? The, market, the Fed is not concerned outside you know, these tail events about volatility in the market. If you look at the VIX, the one thing that has gone up is volatility in the market. But we're at a turning point globally of monetary policy, and volatility usually comes at these turning points. So I don't think the Fed will be concerned by volatility per se, they will be concerned if tail risks materialize and those tail risks impact. So from where you sit at the moment, still on track for four, four raises this year? Absolutely. I, we still, that's our outlook. Mary. Uh, Axel is, is absolutely right. First of all, the Fed is on record and consistent that they will make decisions based on data dependency. The data dependency is not market volatility dependent, but they need to factor in market volatility if it is going to lead to anticipated data that's going to end up being weaker than they expected. So that's where they have to factor it in. They're, they're not sitting there wor worrying about where the stock market's going to be at any one given point. I'm sure, but, it, but to your point earlier, if they were focused on the wealth effect creating growth the first time around, surely asset falls have a drag effect on growth by their own logic. That is for sure. But the question that, that they are asking themselves, and it's the right question to ask, is are these policy moves going to instill confidence in the rest of the world that the U.S. is on solid footing with all the statistics I gave you on the U.S. consumer, it is, and that's the most important thing. It is not to tighten monetary policy. It is to normalize monetary policy. Okay, so and by the way, could you just yeah. give your sense also of what that means for the dollar, if, if you agree with these two? Yeah, so I think the dollar is already strengthened or probably stay where it is. We don't think it's going to go much higher. But, but on the Fed, I'm probably slightly different than the others, where I think they'll probably do three raises instead of four We'll be at probably 75 basis points by this time next year. Uh, but I think what the Fed is thinking about, and I really believe this having met with some of the officials there, is that they have to create some room because over the modern era, our economy, the United States, needs about 300 basis points of stimulus to keep on track, uh, to keep itself out of steep recessions. And so the Fed is looking at that right now and saying, OK, we've got to get the overnight rates back up to like 150, 175, so that when we do eventually have a downturn, there's some bullets in the chamber that we can use. And so I know they're focused on that as well. I think they're less market focused. And as long as you get jobs over 200,000, if those jobs keep printing at 200,000 plus, per month, uh, the Fed will more or less stay on track. I might just add that you, you're look, we're all looking at it from a zero basis and saying how many moves is going to take us. It's important to remember, if you look at all the past Fed tightenings, on average, each year has about 250 basis points of tightening. So we're talking about anywhere from a quarter to a half of that this year. OK. Um, before we throw open to questions, I'd just like to ask one more thing of the panel, which is um, <clears throat> we've got used to some of the policies that have happened in recent years. In Europe, we, as I started with, you know, we are at negative interest rates. That's having some strange impacts on, on the economy, whether it's housing markets in Scandinavia, whether it's effect on the banking system, long-term saving and things. Axel, how long can you take these emergency measures and then make them normality without causing uh, real dislocations? Well, so Europe is not yet at a stage where the central banks are likely to take you know, these measures off because European growth is uh, coming in stronger. 
we expect U.S. growth at 2.8, European growth maybe on average at 1.8, which is not bad, but they're clearly not in the same labor market situation that the U.S. is in. Sure. So I think we're going to see more of these policies. I don't have a scenario where they, uh, in my main outlook, will add to the current policy measures. I think they'll keep in place monetary policy for as long as they said. And unless the economy performs less favorably, they're not going to add further stimulus. They're just going to see that through. And then they're going to slightly take it off in a careful way. Even the Fed, and Mary said that, the Fed is being very muted and very considerate in the way they're taking interest rates up, data dependent. And so I don't expect negative surprises from the Fed. But the real issue is whether sort of Europe and Japan will continue as aggressively as they have in the past. And I think if the, if the objective was to reflate economies back to 2% inflation rate, that objective will not be met in the current environment over the next two years. And so I think the central banks will be less monolithically focused purely on the inflation target, but they'll look at the broader picture of the economy, which is picking up speed, but it's very hard to reflate economies in the current commodity and oil downturn. And they'll look through these short-term volatilities and have a more medium-term. But what, are, but what I'm trying to get at is what are the dangers? I mean, I think it's minus 0.75 in Switzerland right now and minus 0.3 in in the Eurozone, I mean, what is the danger of having these negative rates in place for extended periods of time, be it for the financial system, be it for the way people behave in terms of saving other it's, things? It's just an extreme form <clears throat> of the same different incentives we saw at lower zero rates because it basically incentivizes debt. We are not in a situation where I think increasing debt will bring us out of the current conundrum. So I think the incentives we're seeing are the wrong incentives. And you can do that for a short period, but I don't think you should let, let it last too long. And therefore, you know, and we've heard some news from the Swiss National Bank and others that there will be a point at which they'll take these very negative interest rates off and move more to neutral or close. Raghu, what's your... The, the, the problem is monetary policy gets into all the cracks, as Jeremy Stein said. And uh, the risks do build up. Uh, with a sustained, aggressive monetary policy stance. And we don't always see where they build up. Uh, I mean, we realized that um, high-yield bonds in the U.S. had more risk, and it suddenly came and hit us through oil prices. Uh, but I have no doubt that there are asset prices that are get, getting way away from, from fundamentals the longer these policies last. So... Uh, Unfortunately, of course, central banks have a mandate which they have to respect. So I agree with Axel that there's not much room to change. But as this goes on uh, longer, I think the distortions build up. Uh, yes, wealth effects are good, but you have to figure out what happens at the end of the wealth effects. Do you get a reverse wealth effect when asset prices adjust? So that's something that people have to take into account. And of course, if that is accompanied by increasing leverage, then we get circumstances which are quite unpleasant. And they also have a financial stability mandate increasingly. And I think the issue that you raised about incentivating uh, risk-taking, and therefore for a very long period of time, this could end up in excessively priced markets, uh, there is a financial stability concern that eventually will have to become part of the picture. And I think that will be an argument when central banks are trying to more holistically focus on the sum of these effects across but, markets. And just, Mary, just to f finish with you before we go to questions, but I mean, <clears throat> this issue about risk taking and, and in the US, we saw record buybacks over the last few years as companies you know, borrowed money very cheaply and, and, and bought back their stock. So, um, to what extent was that creating a problem of, of just misallocation of that spending? We weren't seeing capital investment. We weren't seeing this belief in long-term spending for a long-term return building factories or other things. It was much more around how do we financially engineer. Is that a, a problem that, that could you sort of unwind nastily? Or is it something where you think actually you'll start to see with more confidence that longer-term investment coming through? It doesn't necessarily mean that they made mistakes in what they were doing. The CEOs... Across, I'm not suggesting they uh, were mistakes. Across, it was, there was yes. a reason why they were doing it, obviously. They, they, that, that was their best and highest use of cash is what they thought that they were doing. And so a lot of people are talking about all that financial engineering as opposed to real engineering. When can we get back to right. real engineering? And real engineering will happen when we have confidence in what's happening going forward. And we have to remember that this is the first time we've had real yields be this low since 1830 in the United States, aside from wartime. And in wartime, we knew that you force those yields down in order to finance the war, and it would quickly revert back. 
The problem here is you don't know how fast it will revert back, and that's the crisis of confidence that's eating into to what to do from a balance sheet perspective. Brilliant. Let me throw it open to questions. Uh, please, if you have a question you want to ask, do make it into a question with a question mark at the end, not a statement or a, a, your view of the world. Are there any questions we have? <laughs> In the middle there. Can we, can we get a microphone to the middle, please? Thank you. Uh, oh, someone has one here. We'll come back to you in a second, please. Uh, do you think financing war with uh, war bonds will be more beneficial than printing? So, could you say that again, sorry? Uh, do you think financing a war, a next war, with uh, a war bonds that are sold, uh, sold to people will be more beneficial than printing money? Financing wars. With Financing war a war with war bonds will be more beneficial than printing money. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I think a war. Thank you for taking that one. Back. Does create the <laughs> a war does create the opportunity for growth, but it certainly destroys your level of uh, of GDP. So, uh, I mean, I think you'd, most people would take a high level of GDP. Uh, over the opportunity to grow for a long time from near zero levels. Uh, I don't think war is the answer. But, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but that, you know, you're, you're indirectly raising a very serious point that we worry about in our risk calculation. It is the rising tide of nationalism. And you can look historically, I don't remember 1830, but if you could look in st historically, from 1815 to 1915, we had relative peace in Europe. There was few skirmishes but it was because there was living memory of that war, the Napoleonic era. We got to 1914, we ended up in World War I, and then we had a very bad peace treaty, and so we ended up in World War II. We are now 71 years away from the last global conflict, and as the living memory of these wars die out, including not only the veterans, but the people that have actually experienced these wars, you are seeing a systemic rise in nationalism in Europe. People are trying to secede, break away from their countries, the, the uh, UK is going to have a big issue with the EU coming up. You've got tension in Japan and China. Uh, and so one of the things that forums like this should do for the world is remind people about the real horror of war and have us try to figure out our problems in a more unified way. I don't think there was anybody living here in Europe in 1950 or 1955 that wanted to go back to war because they remember the horror of that situation. They were in a period of unification back then. But as we forget we start to disunify, and so we've got to be super careful. And just actually, it'd be interesting to, to ask Axel this um, in Europe, which is, <clears throat> you know, the central bank has had to be very aggressive, um, and we were talking earlier about politicians coming through and making decisions that actually drive the economy forward in terms of structural reform, other things. When you look at the political situation in Europe, the pressures on the EU, the, the, the risk of Britain leaving the EU, you know, the migration crisis in, in Europe, rise of populism. I mean, do you see that being a big threat to that change and something that might actually force the central bank to be more aggressive for longer? No, I think the central banks uh, are focusing very much on, on their own remit and uh, they've built bridges for policymakers to step up their efforts to stabilize economies. And I think ultimately, as Raghu said, we're seeing in some of the peripheral countries that effort uh, is gaining traction and there are leaders and there are elections around doing reforms as a agenda for the next electoral cycle. So we're seeing some more reforms in the periphery and that's good for everyone. The issue that, that really raised uh, here was we have a number of geopolitical risks you know, on the doorstep of Europe and those geopolitical risks are producing spillover effects into Europe. The uh, refugee situation is one of them. And Europe has not had a united position on that. Uh, and I think the response of Europe to the situation so far has been one where the framework that policymakers usually use, for example, the Dublin Agreement, has been waived because uh, of some concerns uh, about the agreement at the time, and people have moved into Europe. Now, we also have a Schengen Agreement, which leads to free uh, migration once you're in the EU. And at the moment, all of these things get mixed. And I think what Europe needs to do is, rather than improvise, they need to use and develop the framework they have. It's absolutely clear to me 
that when Germany waived its right on the Dublin Agreement, which basically meant refugees should be dealt with in the country where they enter the EU, and Germany waived that right and allowed refugees to come to Germany, that did wa this was an upfront deliverable against the expectation that there would be a European agreement on how these refugees would be distributed and taken care of within the EU. Now, as a policymaker, you could always say, never waive a right until you have the replacement treaty in place. And that is some of the debate we're seeing in Germany now. But I think ultimately it will get fixed because not fixing the issue will lead to a, le a reinforcement of the Dublin Agreement. And that will mean we'll see border controls, we'll see more internal tidying up. And that's not the way forward for a liberal society like but Just to be clear, you don't see some of the political challenges of Europe that I've described around the EU, whether it's Britain's relationship, other things, actually having a chilling effect on the ability of governments to follow through and make the decisions that they need to make for the economy. Never waste a good crisis. The current crisis in Europe about migration, immigration and refugees will focus politicians' mind to solving the underlying issues of Europe that have been largely unresolved for the last 10 years. Europe either needs to integrate further for those that have the euro, and in my view, become more optional for those that don't want the euro as the single currency. Unless we have this bifurcation of interests in Europe, I think Europe will continue to face challenges. And it's not a centrist construction from the start. So allowing for some flexibility in the European endeavor, in my view, will be key and negotiating further. Otherwise, there is a, deg there is a risk that the current degree of integration that Europe has achieved will set back to some degree and revert. And I think that's a very bad outcome. So I think European policymakers need to get to the table and really have a clear view on how they develop Europe forward in an institutional framework, including these treaties like Schengen, Dublin and others, and including how to deal with the British, uh, who don't want the euro and therefore have a different view of what their European endeavor will be. And I'm, I'm seeing that starting now, but like always, and you could make the point for China, they're late to the game and they're actually slow in acting. But I think the crisis will fall to their hands. Great. Mary, you wanted to say yeah, something? Yeah, I just wanted to add, we, we shouldn't forget how much we should applaud the leaders and the policymakers in Europe and what they've accomplished. You, you look at the work that the World Economic Forum has done on the commonality of the countries within the European Union. They are as different, you know, Germany is as different to Greece and Italy as the United States is to Mexico. And yet they've been able to pull off what they've done. So if you look at the hundred factors that the World Economic Forum looks at, it is, it is so difficult to pull these nations together and act with some form of commonality. And they've been able to do it, albeit, you know, lots and lots of challenges. And they've got a lot ahead of them. But I think, you know, current crises, uh, as Axel says, will be able to help them to continue to forge forward. Brilliant. Sorry, question in the middle. Yeah, it's related that, you know, uh, the, you are talking about the monetary policy and uh, uh, QE in Japan, the uh, euro. But uh, I think the most important thing is the combination of the QE and uh, uh, the structural reform on each country. Each country, uh, the structural reform contents would be different. Like Japan is an uh, agricultural issue, a medical issue, and the vested interest issue we have to solve. In the Europe, in the country by country, of course, uh, Germany, and uh, 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 Greece and uh, France and the uh, structural reform contents are different. The, uh, without talking about the uh, structural reform, uh, we couldn't uh, attain the 2% uh, growth only by the uh, monetary policy. Okay, so do you, what's the question that you... Yeah, uh, this, uh, I'd like to ask you, the, uh, Mr. Weber, well, we talked about this last time I visited you in Japan. And, you know, I think the, the big advantage of Abenomics was that for one of the first times in a policy discussion framework, he actually posed all three policies together with the three arrows. So it was very clear fiscal and monetary are part of the package, but they cannot do it alone. The third arrow, structural reforms, was as important. I would say it didn't deserve the number three. It should have been the first arrow. Because once you actually fire structural reforms, and we've seen that in Germany with Schroeder's reform, it's a slow flying arrow. Monetary and fiscal are much quicker. But unless you start on the road of really implementing structural changes, which take long, which have a very negative upfront effect in the sense that initially you don't see the benefits of them. They only materialize long term. 
but it's just the right thing to do. And I think in Europe, the central bank and fiscal expansion has made it too easy for policymakers not to embark on the structural uh, early on. Now, in the current situation, it's all about getting structural policies right, because as we said before, monetary and fiscal have run their course and have very little to add given the degree of expansion that they by now have assumed. Great. Any other questions? Here at the back. I'll come to you next. Uh, Paul Sheard from uh, McGraw Hill Financial. Maybe a question for, uh, for Axel and uh, Raghuram. It, it, it seems to be the case that the natural rate of interest is in negative territory. If that is a result, not so much or not so much because of the, the legacy issues from the financial crisis and the Great Recession, but it turns out it's much more related to the fourth industrial revolution issues that are the focus of this Davos conference. What sort of implications do you think that has for policy frameworks, and particularly for central banks with inflation targeting frameworks? Do they all have to be relooked and maybe a new framework put in place? Well, it, it's, a, it's a very important question. Uh, first, uh, uh, there is a real question, what does it mean when the national rate of interest is negative? Uh, it's basically saying that in order to reach some sort of equilibrium, uh, real interest rates have to be far lower than, uh, than what typically is feasible. Now, there could be a number of reasons for that. Uh, one reason for a very low negative uh, national rate is, is if investment's not picking up. But there are a variety of reasons why investment doesn't pick up. Uh, demand is one of them. Uh, low productivity growth is one of them. And the net effect of all this could be that it looks as if the only way you can get equilibrium is by pushing interest rates really down. But it may also mean there are a whole set of structural reforms that Axel has been talking about, which would elevate rates of return on investment and would actually push the natural rate a little higher than, than what, what it looks like now. So we don't really know which world we are in, we just know that things aren't working even though interest rates are so low. Uh, the, the real question is should we focus on pushing them even lower or should we try and do the other things that make investment and consumption more attractive, fixing social security, raising the productivity of investment and so on. As far as the fourth industrial revolution and, and what it does, it's, it's unclear right now what it does to rates of return. I mean, the, the first natural view would be that it increases rates of return by increasing, increasing productivity, it increases the rate of return associated with capital, we should be seeing more investment. But we're not seeing it. Why aren't we seeing more investment? Is it because we need to invest not in physical assets, but in processes and in human capital? Is that where the money is going? I think there's a lot of uncertainty about how the fourth industrial revolution is playing out and where exactly it's affecting us. And I think this is worth thinking about. I don't think the natural reaction is to push interest rates further down. Great. So the question with the man in the scarf here. I'd like to ask a question about emerging markets. Uh, given that much of the flows into emerging markets over the last few years has only been... So could you, do, could you actually use the microphone, please? Uh, the question is about emerging markets. Uh, given that a lot of the flows into emerging markets were largely due to the liquidity surge and the quantitative easing done by various central banks, and now you're having a kind of a reversal, uh, the flows are going back. What is it that is really going to make the flows come back, come back stronger? And are, are we likely to see a return to the same level of flows or is it going to be much lower? And we're going to pro possibly uh, prepare ourselves for a more lower, stable uh, rate of flows. So you're saying what will push flows back towards emerging markets? Back into emerging markets. markets. <clears throat> flows back into emerging markets. Well, I mean, I, I can speak from a capital allocation perspective. Uh, I, I, I think the world has to grow. Uh, and so we're in this sort of sclerosis environment right now, but I think we're about to embark upon better than expected growth as we go through the medical technology revolution, the robotic technology revolution, and other types of things like this. Uh, as the Western nations grow, uh, the emerging markets will probably grow a lot faster than the Western nations. And so you'll see capital actually getting allocated into the emerging markets for really good reasons, for fundamental reasons, as opposed to just uh, uh, quantitative easing, forcing out the risk spectrum. So I think it's gonna be a matter of growth at this point. I just, well, Sorry, America. Uh, yeah, no, I would just add, uh, one of the largest institutional investors in the United States uh, does a poll of, uh, at the very beginning of the year as to the thoughts on the best five investment ideas in the, and the, for the one year and for the three year. And the best 
uh, one-year idea is to short emerging markets equities, and the best three-year idea is to go long emerging markets equities. <laughs> Raggy, you just well. I, I was just going to say uh, one of the problems with uh, with capital flows is their uh, high volatility. The one year versus the three year being an example, and and the real problem uh, a number of emerging markets have is they they don't have the systems to handle that volatility. You can't take in a huge inflow and then see it go out without it creating disruptions in, internally. Now, for us to handle that, the best thing we can do is have good policies. That's the first line of defense. Improve your policy framework. Let people understand what they can expect. That's, that's the first line. The second line is try and encourage more risk capital. We need risk capital. We don't need riskless capital sitting on one day money wanting to get out the next day because uh, it's, it's, it's a good return that they're getting. I mean, we, we, can, we don't have the systems to tolerate that kind of volatility. What we would like is longer term money coming in and uh, providing a lot of finance. A lot of equity flows have come into India, which are doing a good thing. They're providing risk capital to all our businesses. That's what we really need uh, in, the, in the longer term. And the last line of defense is reserves. We, when the flow comes in, don't get deluded that they're coming in because you're great. They're coming in to a whole lot of other emerging markets. At that time, build your defenses so when they turn and say, none of you look good, you can at least withstand the first uh, outflow. After that, people think. After the first initial volatile reaction, people take stock. Where would I like to be? Can I differentiate amongst the emerging markets? You want to be prepared to let the first flow go out so that you're ready for the second when they start rethinking. And are the defense is strong enough? Uh, certainly, our defense, I think, is, is pretty good. <laughs> but I never say never. We're, we're vigilant. We're, we're aware that... that things can, can get nasty very quickly. But I think some of the old distinctions aren't really true anymore with the fourth industrial revolution. We used to talk about the industrial countries and emerging markets, and this is where, you know, before Raghu and I, uh, you know, agreed on one uh, argument, even so when you use the emerging versus industrial country framework, uh, you, you tend to disagree because what, who will benefit from the fourth industrial revolution? It will be skilled, labor, it will be those that will make good use of automization, extreme automization, connectivity. They're no longer solely placed in industrial countries. They are placed in industrial countries, and Silicon Valley is just a paradigm for that. But it increasingly happens in other countries as well. So my view is, yes, the industrial revolution, the force might have the potential for depressing interest rates for longer. This is what Paul asked about, because the dividend of this industrial re revolution will accrue to those that are high skilled and invest in these industries. And they usually are already quite wealthy and have high saving rates. And we're gonna to continue to see high savings in that part of the population. But I think it really, the distinction is no longer industrial countries versus emerging, it's more high skilled jobs right. and connectivity and infrastructure and low skilled jobs where the major divide will be. So I think we would see an emergence and a continuation of basically diversity and, uh, you know, between the rich and the poor, and our economies will be much less homogeneous than they have been in the past. And that's an issue for politics to really take up and to kind of put in place educational incentives to really have flexible economies where you can react to these new opportunities and where you have a skilled workforce that can seize these opportunities. Interesting. Just, uh, we'll have, uh, we, we may have time for two, but I think let's do this one first, please. So, um... <laughs> Be prior to, to, to Lehman meltdown, we, we were a debt-driven uh, growth economy. Uh, since then, we talk, there's a lot of talk about deleveraging, but the fact is that from, from a government point of view, from a corporate point of view, from an individual point of view, the, you have the same amount of leverage st still left in the system, and it's certainly a drag on growth. And uh, I, you know, the question I have is, so we've, we've eased... Uh, for the past bunch of years to hope for enough growth that would diminish the importance of that level of debt. But here we are, we haven't had the growth, we still have the same level of debt. You know, what's the solution and, and what's, you know, well, how do you deal with the problem of interest rates rising and this too. amount of leverage? I, 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 to the bankers, I guess. Well, I'll, I'll start by saying that uh, Barry, I think it's policy more than anything else. And so 
if, if Dr. Bernanke was up here, we'd say we relied on one leg of the stool, which was monetary policy, but you need to get regulatory reform in the United States and at least corporate tax reform, if not personal income tax reform. Uh, and that's probably true glo globally. If you can get those things done, there is a lot of debt, but there's still a ton of cash as well. And you could see the restaging of a new investment cycle uh, that would carry the world, I think, in a faster growing position than anybody uh, has said in these salons over the last two years. And just to wrap up, this is probably the last word to Mary. I think that the U.S. economy is showing that even with the leverage that's on, that's on the books, a lot of the corporations have done a lot of financial reengineering. They've been able to finance themselves and take advantage of these low rates. Their maturity levels are out to a place where they'll be able to invest in the future and with a little bit of confidence and, and a little bit of optimism hopefully coming out of these next couple of days here. Hopefully we can get the world on the right track. Great. Well, thank you all very much indeed. That was a, a fabulous panel and, and very interesting to see that people seem to have decided that, yes, central banks distorted asset markets, but they did it for good reason and that there is some optimism out there. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs>